Hi everybody, this is again Thomas Hören for University of Münster. This is the second part of my short presentations on European data protection law and it, I hope that my consideration will help you to understand what we do in Europe with data protection. Again, I prepared some PowerPoint slides and which will help you to understand what I said. You will find um, the link to the PowerPoint files, files um, under the video. <clears throat> Let me talk about the structure of this presentation. First, I have to do with uh, the competencies in European law in the area of data protection, who can govern competent uh, data protection law. Then we are speaking about the relationship between European and national data protection law under the directive. Then we are talking about the history and systematics of a general uh, data protection regulation. Then we talk about the relationship between European and national law as defined by the data protection regulation that's different from data protection directive. Then we are talking about central terms of the data protection regulation, the scope of application of the regulation and the general questions of lawfulness of data protection and the rights of the data subjects. Let us start with the competences. Who is responsible for data protection in Europe? <clears throat> According to the European Treaty, Article 16, there can be a regulated, the EU can regulate <coughs> specific rules on the protection of individuals with regard of, uh, to processing of personal data and the free movement of personal data. Article 39 says it is the matter for the Council to decide upon the rules which have to be established in Europe. We had very early attempts of the European Union to make a common framework for data protection, the so-called Data Protection Directive. So, um, what is the relationship between European law and national law as to the directive. A directive is not directly binding for um, uh, the citizens, it is only binding for the states which are bound to implement a directive into national laws. So the former data protection directive attempts to force all member states to implement national laws. So Germany did it in 2001 and changed its very old Federal Data Protection Act according to the directive. That proved um, to be a very complicated way of transformation because every member state has had a different approach in implementing the directive. Belgium, for instance, was very lax and, and liberal. Germany was very hard. So we had different levels of implementation and that leads to the need to make a regulation. A regulation in data protection means uh, 
it's directly binding for all citizens, corporations and state. So you don't need to implement the European text. That was due to the fact that the data protection directive from 1995 was very soon considered to be technically outdated. So they made a proposal for a regulation in 2012 and after a long, long discussion, there was harsh lobbying, you can feel it. When you read the regulation, every lobbyist said no, yes, yes, no, no, no. Um, after that, we had the general data protection regulation. So a European-wide overall data protection regulation, uh, regulation, very astonishing for some member states. The relationship of European law and national law of this um, data protection regulation was regulated in Article 288, which says that the GDPR is binding in all parts and directly applicable in all member states since May 2018. So it's primarily, primarily law compared to um, national laws. So <coughs> the member states are not allowed to deviate, but regulations um, may contain some clauses stating that the member states have a right to concretize or deviate from the regulation. That is on, the on one hand an optional opening clause that it might as well be a mandatory opening clause. It's not enough to simply um, implement the GDPR by repeating all the words of the GDPR. So, and the member states have to be aware that exception were only foreseen um, when you have an opening clause in GDPR and is necessary to maintain clarity of the law. Central terms is for especially um, Article 4. What is a personal data? It is any information relating to an identified or even identifiable natural person. That means name, addresses, photographs, very important photographs are now a topic of data protection law. All this is um, regulated by the GDPR. The only way to es escape uh, the personal personality of data is to anonymize or pseudonymize data that is defined in Article 4. Another very important term is processing and that is defined in difference to former German law uh, in a very broad sense, it means any operation or a set of operation which is performed upon personal data, whether automatic or unautomatic, so it doesn't uh, matter whether the, the data are in paper files or in computers, everything is processing. And if you ask yourself, what happens if I have processed personal data? Um, 
what does the GDPR say? say? It says every possessing of personal data is in general prohibited. As an exception, there are some justification for possessing of personal data, but that are only exceptions. So another important term is controller and processor who is responsible for all these regulations in the GDPR is the controller. Controller is a person, legal or national, which determines the purposes and means of the processing of personal data. Processor is a person who is processing personal data on behalf of the controller. So you have the first party who is responsible to adhere to the GDPR is a controller and there is a secondary liability of the processor, for instance, a company working for another. Article 2 explains the material scope of the application automated processing as well as non-automated processing is regulated under GDPR. Exceptions are only foreseen um, in cases where the data processing was made for exclusively personal or household activities. So if that's very f narrowly interpreted as family processing if you process the data within the family. The territorial scope of application in Article 3 is an, another new element. The processing of personal data, which is carried out by an establishment of a controller or a processor in the Union, is always a topic of the GDPR. But even if the processing is made by a controller or processor not established in the Union, the GDPR applies if the processing activities are related to offering goods or services to a person of the EU. So if you are a company situated in South Africa and you are offering goods or services, for instance, via internet for European citizens, you have to um, adhere and obey to the GDPR. That's very new and that's an attempt of the European Commission to regulate, for instance, Facebook or Google, which have their seat in the United States, but if they are direct their services to European citizens, they are directly bound by the GDPR. So, that is the most important sentence in the whole uh, Data Protection Directive uh, Regulation, Article 6. Article 6 says the processing of personal data is in general prohibited. That's the German principle to say in general you are not allowed to possess personal data. To compare that to other states, the French decision had, has always been um, only prohibit the use of sensitive data, personal data because these sensitive data are so dangerous to be used. So they have the model, we call it the onion theory, 
that you have a different level of protection for simple personal data compared to sensitive data, personal data where the use is strongly prohibited. So you find in the GDPR both model, models on the one hand the German prohibition of personal data processing in Article 6 and you find in Article 8 the model of even more prohibited use of sensitive personal data. So if you take Article 6 there is an exception. Um, you can use personal data in certain circumstances. For in circumstance 1, A, if you have the consent of data subjects. Consent is a magna carta of data protection law. If you can prove that you have a consent of the person concerned, it's okay. But you can even use data without consent and most important um, element is um, F. F means the purposes of the legitimate interests pursued by the controller or by a third party uh, prevail. You, you have a, a legitimate interest which allows you as a company to say yes I want to do I need the data so I will process it. <clears throat> it seems to be very complicated because Article 6, 6 says the use is prohibited. That sounds very, very harsh. But then you have Article 6, subsection 1, sub subsection F, which says you, you can, as an exception, you can use all this data which you can prove a legitimate interest. So, harsh principle at the beginning, but a very open exception for companies. <clears throat> what is the consent? That means uh, you have to uh, um, prove that you have the consent. In general, it means written declarations. It can be revoked, the consent. So it might be very dangerous to ask for a consent because the person concerned can simply say, I don't want it to happen. And there's another very really harsh principle. Article 7 prohibits the tying of a consent with, <coughs> with other services. So for instance, a bank, banking institution which says, um, yes, you can get my services, but only if you are consenting to scoring information and storing um, uh, scoring data. That is strongly prohibited. Article 9 is then the French model, as I explained. Special categories of personal data, sensitive data, are even more restricted and the use is prohibited. Then you need a really specific exceptions for using, for instance, medical data, sexual data, trade union data, political opinions, and so on. The data subject has very fundamental rights which are necessary to understand. The right of access to data in Article 15, the right to rectification, Article 16, the right to restriction of processing, Article 18, the, that's new, the right to data portability, Article 20, 
So you can ask the person using your data to get a co copy so that you can transfer this data to another person. That uh, means you have a right uh, to data portability that you can take the data away from one processor and one controller to another. New is as well the right to erasure. We call it the right to be forgotten because personal data must be deleted without unreasonable delay in certain cases for instance the data are no longer necessary the consent is revoked or the data subject exercises um, his rights to ob object against uh, processing the data protection processing was uh, unlawful and data collection of children's data there are some exceptions foreseen when you are not obliged to delete for instance when the data processing is still necessary for exercising right of expression or um, for press so the press can have data longer for their press purposes. The right to be forgotten has nothing to do with the famous um, European Court of Justice decision on Google. There the court invented a new right to be forgotten which has nothing to do with data protection and they said uh, if Google is storing data and there's no need to do it the person concerned has a right to be forgotten so this um, two traditions of the right to be forgotten on the one hand GDPR, on the second um, European Court of Justice was as well stressed by the Federal Sub uh, Constitutional Court in Germany. So it's always a problem that press has data which are for instance old. This person has, been, has committed a crime and the person concerned says oh that was 10 years ago i want to be forgotten and i claim my constitutional rights to stop that processing then you have to weigh the interests of the parties involved and there's a high weight of the interests of the press there's another striking feature um, in Article 22, there is also foreseen a right to be not, not subjected to a decision based solely on automated processing. That means that is a harsh protection against artificial intelligence decisions when the computer is the only one who is preparing a decision, decision uh, that can be stopped. So this ends my second volume. <clears throat> I hope you have understood that the GDPR is of utmost importance for you. You can feel it in South Africa because <coughs> certain elements of European data protection legislation can be found in South African law. So you have to look towards Europe in order to work um, as an international corporation using data between Europe 
and Africa, you have to stick to the rules of the GDPR. So please be aware of these, I admit, complicated uh, law subjects. Thank you very much for your patience. I hope you will listen to me in the third volume when I speak about the transformation of the GDPR to German law.